This is going to be a lot more off the cuff and slow than my typical content, simply because I really want to use this video as a way of exploring uh, feelings I have and ideas that I'm coming up with on the fly, as opposed to one, a scripted video, or two, a reaction video, which are basically the only kinds of things I do anymore in this channel. Uh, my name is Gibby, I've been covering Chris Chan for a little over five years, and my office is currently a mess. Please ignore it. I'm also still getting used to my camera and microphone setup, so bear with me. I want to talk from the heart about my opinion on people who interact with Chris who also make content related to him, because I think that my feelings are very uh, nuanced, and I think that there's a value in getting different perspectives on the topic. This is not a new phenomenon. Obviously, the entire Christian saga began with people who were documenting him on forums, then going out and interacting with him, whether they were making fan art, or they were trolling him in other capacities, or secretly recording him in church. The entire Christian phenomenon was people messing with him. The justification for this at the time was twofold. One, it was funny. And two, Chris was a bad person because he was homophobic, because he threatened people with violence, and therefore it was okay to mock him. After this, there was a long period of quiet when it comes to documenting and mocking Chris, and it didn't really pick up again until after Gino's documentary started. And I'm going to be talking about Gino's documentary a couple times. I do think up front I should make it very clear that, one, I have not finished it, I have expressed this a couple times, but the last thing I want to do with my free time is watch Chris Chan content, and I hope you guys understand, I hope Gino understands. I love your series. I think that it is a phenomenal look into the story of Chris. I think you do the best job you can possibly do being objective. I think your presentation and editing and recording are amazing. But partially, I don't want it to bias my own reporting, and then partially, I just don't have the emotional capacity to learn about Chris when I'm not sitting down at my computer specifically to learn about Chris. My overall feeling when it comes to interacting or talking with Chris is that there's a conflict of interest the moment that money enters the picture. I think for two reasons, it's very acceptable that Gino has interacted with Chris in the past. For one, he's not making money on his documentary. His channel is not monetized, he's talked about this a couple times, but in case you don't know the story, his channel was taken down for bullying, not for him bullying Chris, but for discussing the concept of bullying. And so when he brought it back up, he did it on an unmonetized channel. This may have changed, but that's the last I heard on this topic. So not only is Gino not making money, but I do think that the content he makes is very different than people like me who make content on the ongoing uh, breaking news development stories of Chris. Gino is making a documentary that theoretically will live on into infinity with the things that he's saying being the, uh, I'm going to say, definitive documentation of Chris. And so I think there is a value in potentially speaking to Chris and going back and asking his perspective on certain topics. I think it's more good more good. I think it's more helpful to um, try to get to the truth of the matter by getting multiple perspectives than it is to simply leave out Chris because you don't want to talk to him. And so I would have no issue if in the future Gino does interact with Chris and speak to him about making the documentary more truthful. Likewise, I don't have a problem with people who make content about Chris that I consider to be artistically valuable. Like Helena Pikachu makes artwork and comics about Chris, and I think that they have a legitimate, I don't want to call it friendship, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think that there is a, a bond, a connection between them, at least on the professional level, or there was before he was arrested, that is completely valid. It's understandable that the two will interact and create artwork and bounce off of each other. Artwork both literally in the terms of drawing and also in storytelling and whatever you would call role-playing on Twitter, I don't know if that's storytelling. I mean, it is storytelling, I don't know how you could categorize it. I don't think there's an issue with that because the interaction with Chris is necessary to create the artwork that they're looking to create. And obviously there's always an abstract benefit that people get creating content even if it's not monetized, like Pikachu does not get sold in little comic books, and Gino, again, his channel's not monetized, but obviously the two of their, uh, Helen and Gino's reputations go up because of the quality of their content. Helena is able to sell art commissions, and Gino has other channels where he is monetized. He has his music career and then his other documentaries. But again, I, that's why I'm talking about this context in a very nuanced way. I don't think that what they're doing is wrong. 
Likewise, I see value in the interactions that Dylan Thomas had back when he was covering Chris Chan with Chris. After the story broke about Chris and Barb, Dylan reached out to him and asked him if it was true. Chris confided in Dylan that it was, in fact, true and that he trusted him. Dylan, of course, then immediately leaked these DMs. They are some of the most important evidence we have that what Chris did with Barb allegedly actually happened because Chris admitted to it. We already had him admitting it to Noel, but having Dylan also be part of that is, I think, extremely valuable evidence. I don't think that these actions were necessarily in bad faith. I don't think that Dylan wanted to be the person breaking the story. I don't think he did it for monetary reasons. I think that, especially at that time, everybody was very emotional about what was happening. I can't even say a full sentence. Back to what I was saying, I think that um, Dylan reaching out to Chris, it was a very special circumstance because it kind of seemed like that era of chris was over, that like the legal system was going to uh, take over any day now, and that what we really needed were solid answers. So once again, I do not blame Dylan for reaching out to Chris, or really for any interactions they had had in the past, like, at all, really. My main issue comes with a phenomenon that I don't think I've ever discussed on this channel, because it paints some public people in a very bad light, and I also don't have hard evidence that the way I'm going to now tell the story actually happened. I think part of reporting on anything is doing as minimal harm as possible, that's one of the tenets of journalism, and while I hesitate to call what I do journalism, there is at least the expectation that I do my best to not harm people. So I'm not going to name any names, and I'm going to say to take this with a grain of salt, but there was an instance in which somebody who was covering Chris for money had the idea or expressed the desire to interact with Chris in such a way that they would get breaking news before anybody else. This would help grow their channel or grow whatever videos that they were planning on making. They would sort of uh, befriend Chris or have one-on-one -on -one interactions with him that could, uh, best case scenario, just mean that they get stories and information before anybody else, and worst case scenario, could mold the story of Chris Story to something more interesting. Um, this person, thankfully, is no longer making Chris Chan content. I think that had that plan gone through, it would have been, one, a very negative thing for the community, because I don't think that anybody should be manipulating Chris, especially for profit, and two, I think it would have been very damaging to that person's reputation should this information ever get out, should they have actually profited off Chris in a non-ethical way. Obviously, there have been instances in the past where people have profited on manipulating Chris. The Idea Guys got Chris to send them a lot of money and buy them things. Isabella Janke also was able to profit off of Chris because he would buy her things. And that's obviously bad, and people see them as villains, and I don't think that somebody could really have a public-facing YouTube channel while being a villain of chris -tory. I think that that would probably be frowned upon. All of this to say that the phenomenon of interacting with Chris is nothing new. It's not something that has sprung up since after Chris left jail, but I do think that we're in a very odd point in history. The existence of Geno's documentary has greatly increased the knowledge of Chris Chan across the internet, and then after his arrest, I think that Chris's life, which I have before called a real-life Truman Show, is now being broadcast to more people than ever. New people discover Gino's documentary, more people discover my channel, more people discover the ongoing tale of Chris. And so I think that we're in a unique point in history where we have a large influx of new people discovering the story of Chris who might not know every single detail that's happened. There's a tendency for people to focus on the early years of Chris. That's why there's a lot of videos on YouTube about people trying to rank the trolls, and they usually talk about people like Liquid Chris and Blue Spike. These people who haven't been relevant in, like, 20 years. It's because when you start watching Gino's documentary, those are the first couple of episodes. It's because whenever you read anything about Chris, going back those 20 years, those are the things that have the most discussion. It's kind of like a vicious cycle or a self-fulfilling prophecy. The early years of Chris will always be the things that are discussed the most because they're the early years. This unfortunately leads people to treat the modern-day Chris as if he is the old Chris. At some point, I would love to do a video on um, a video that ContraPoints made about Chris Chan in general. I think that the major mistake that she made in her video is treating the Chris Chan community in the late 2010s the same that the Chris Chan community was in 2006. I'm very critical of her for doing that and for broadcasting that to her audience, and so likewise, I'm very critical of these new trolls and weens and enablers for treating modern-day Chris like the old Chris. Chris is right on his live stream to call out people for just super chatting him Julie because yes, it is a dead meme. 
It is something that nobody really has thought about in over a decade. It's something that's not funny anymore, but it's funny to these people because, at least in my experience, they are new to the Chris Chan story. We see this with enablers as well. The um, Otaku King, who is making all the same mistakes as enablers in the past, I think that he does get some leeway because clearly he doesn't know the full story of Chris. But at the same time, all that information is up there documented in video and written format, I think that it's kind of inexcusable for him to be making content about Chris and explaining that he wants to help and enable Chris when the information as to why he should not do that is readily available to him. I think that other people, people who are leaving anonymous comments on Chris's videos or Twitter or super chats on his live stream, sort of don't really think about how their reputation is at stake, and I think that that is possibly a mistake. One, because Kiwi Farms is going to go after anybody who negatively impacts Chris, and two, because I think there's an aspect to your identity that goes beyond just what's sort of publicly displayed. I think that the things that you do online, even when anonymous, reflect poorly on your character, even if nobody knows about them. It's like the, the story of the Invisible Man, or the, the ring that makes you invisible that the Invisible Man is based on. I think that's one of those old myths. It's a story from Plato, the Ring of Gyges. When given a ring, a shepherd named Gyges becomes invisible and anonymous. Through his invisibility, he seduces a queen, kills her king, and takes over the kingdom. Yeah, like, the moral of that story is that he's still a bad person even though he's invisible and nobody knows what's going on. It still reflects poorly on you, and you're probably going to regret it in your future life if you do things on the internet anonymously. So, this is the part of the video where I say that not only should you not interact and troll Chris because the Kiwi Farms are going to come after you, but you shouldn't interact and troll Chris because you look like a loser. Chris has been live streaming a lot, and I've been taking a lot of time going through them and trying to make them digestible in shorter video formats, and one of the things that's very disheartening is the amount of people who are sending Chris money in order to troll him. To send him, like, one sentence, maybe maximum one paragraph messages to, like, upset him. And he doesn't get upset by them. He doesn't care. Nobody cares that you're stating the obvious about Chris and what Chris did. He's not gonna feel bad about it. There was one comment in particular I highlighted in one of my videos where somebody said that they want to be put in Gino's documentary. And that's really the phenomenon of wanting to be a part of Chris story that I don't understand. Do you really want your comment to be part of the Chris Chan documentary? Do you really want to be forever known as the guy who gave Chris money to basically do the equivalent of jumping on a live TV camera and saying, hi mom, like if that's your greatest immortalized accomplishment, you're a loser. There's other people who've had that sentiment. Um, it was very infamously stated by Bella around the time of the leaked audio that she wanted to be a part of Christory. She wanted to be part of, I think she said, the, the last saga? The final Chris Chan saga? Go down in history? Or Christory? The narrative of Chris is obviously a, uh, a non-fiction, real-life thing, but I do think it's very intriguing that people categorize people involved in the story as heroes and villains, and if there is a villain in the Chris story, Bella is one of the worst. Bella's end goal was to become a part of Christory, and I think anybody who's studying it should, like, understand that that's a bad thing. For a while, I was upset that I had a page on the quickie, simply because I don't think that I am a part of Christory. There's other people who don't have pages that I think are more important, like Tara Strong, who has actually interacted with Chris and who is famous and who has done things with her life. Why do I, a random YouTuber, have a page and she doesn't? I've since come to terms with this because Chris has started mentioning me, because he's drawn me, because he's retweeted me, because he's left comments under my video. I think it's important for future Christorians who are looking in the past and looking at these live streams that when Chris says, this is you, Gibby, that they can go on the quickie and see who this Gibby person was and see that I was a YouTuber who talked about Chris. I don't like it, but I do think that that is a valuable aspect of the quickie. It is something to document. With that said, I'm still proud of the fact that I can say with all honesty that I have never interacted with Chris. He's left comments on my videos, and I've not responded to them. He has retweeted me, and I've not responded to them. When I want to display something he has tweeted on Twitter, I take a screenshot of it instead of retweeting it. He drew a picture of me and said that I could get it for free if I reached out to the Praetors, and obviously I did not do that. I think that once you get a taste of um, having that, that scoop, the availability of you to be the first person to document something, I think that that is a very slippery slope, and I don't ever want to be in the position where that's a possibility. Back when the Watchmen first contacted me, do people still know who the Watchmen are? The Watchmen were this group of people who, like, befe befriended and defended Chris. Back when they first contacted me, they said that if I was nice to Chris, they would give me inside scoops that they weren't going to give other YouTubers. 
I basically turned this down by saying that I was not going to be nice to Chris because they were going to give me inside scoops. I was going to continue to treat Chris the way that I did, which was with some amount of pity. Defending him physically from people like Jacob? This is obviously an attitude that I no longer have after his alleged crime. The main reason I'm making this video is because there is a new YouTuber who is documenting Chris and breaking news about Chris. And the same way that I'm going to censor the name of people who say that they want to be in Gino's documentary and Chris's live streams, I'm not going to tell you the name of this channel. I'm not hiding it, and if that person's watching this video, they know who they are, and people who are already subscribed to them know exactly who I'm talking about. But they have stated before that they do want to interact with Chris. They've said they want to get Chris into their Discord server and play Dungeons and Dragons with him, because it would be funny. There have been a couple generations of Chris Chan YouTubers since I personally started. A lot of them have come and gone, and there's really only been a few consistencies, mainly me and Gino. I still consider Smokey to be one of the newer people covering Chris Chan, and at the very least I can respect him for not going out of his way to contact Chris. For not taking advantage of the situation, for not treating Chris as some sort of get-rich-quick scheme, which is what the Praetors are doing. And so for this new person to come on and think that they can grow their channel by interacting with Chris, it makes me very disheartened. Because the last couple generations of people who started making Chris content knew not to do that. And as far as I know, none of them did. And as I said earlier, the one channel who did no longer makes content. They were chased out of the community. I don't- I'm not saying that I want you to chase this person out of the community, I'm saying basically to this person, it's not too late to reevaluate what you want to do. If you want to cover Chris, if you want to make videos about the ongoing tale of Chris Chan, if you want to read the quickie and talk about old things that have happened, if you want to have breaking news, you don't have to go right to the source. You don't have to become part of the story. And if you look at the people who are part of the story, I don't think you want to be. I don't think you want to be remembered as that one person who interacted with Chris for a couple months and then faded into obscurity. Just like I don't think that one anonymous YouTube commenter wants to be remembered in Gino's documentary as the person who gave Chris money to be in a YouTube video. Just as I'm sure Bella regrets being a part of Christory. Chris stated recently that he has no intentions of ever speaking to Jacob Sockness again. In fact, he said he's never going to even say Jacob's name. But Jacob is still trying to reach out to Chris. He wants to interact with him. He wants to meet back up with him. And I'm very glad that that's simply not going to happen. I think Jacob was a very emblematic part of Christory because he highlighted the phenomenon that the more people knew about Chris, the more people would be around to mess with him. And I think he raised the question on the ethics of covering Chris at all. Jacob only found out about Chris through Gino's documentary, and I think that raised the question of, is Gino then responsible for things Jacob did? My answer is no, not at all, because Gino has never asked people to try to... I'm not even going to talk about what Jacob did. If you want to know that, you can, you can watch other videos on my channel. I simply don't think that you're responsible for what people in your audience do unless you're asking them to do it. Like, it's almost guaranteed, based on my subscriber count, that somebody watching this is like a psychopath. Very possibly, like, a murderer. And that does not make me responsible for their actions unless I say, go and, you know, harm Chris. Likewise, Gino is not responsible for Jacob, Dylan is not responsible for Bella. Say what you will about the idea, guys, but at the very least, they wanted to remain anonymous. They wanted to keep milking Chris for money and their own personal laughs whereas these new people seemingly want to be a part of Christory because, frankly, my only interpretation is that they have nothing else going on in their lives. It's like a sad admittance that the best thing that they could possibly do with their time is be a part of Gino's documentary. There was a particular user who was on my old Discord server before it got shut down, who I think everybody who was on there would remember, who had a sort of mental breakdown and said that they wanted to be the new Chris Chan. They wanted to be documented like Chris. This is obviously not the desires of a sane individual. I really think you only have to compare that to the fact that Chris does in fact want to be documented to see that that's not something a normal person would want. Chris likes Gino's documentary. He doesn't like how it sometimes paints him in a bad light or shows some of his mistakes on video, but he likes the fact that people document him. He really wants a Wikipedia page. It's a weird phenomenon of egotism and narcissism, which obviously Chris has, because he currently thinks he's Jesus. 
and frankly, I don't understand watching the entire story of Chris Chan play out and then saying, yeah, him, I want to be like him, I want to be like Chris, I want to be like Bella, I want to be like the idea guys. Wouldn't it be funny if there was a new Liquid Chris? And the answer is no. The best thing that could happen for Chris Tree and for people interested in Chris's story is for it to become extremely boring. I think I've said the word disheartening a lot, but I've gotten a lot of comments on my recent YouTube videos of people who are saying that modern Chris Tree is boring. And like, yeah, that's how it was for a decade before the audio leaked. If you don't want to just sit there and read all of his nonsense about the dimensional merge, there's not really a story here for you. This isn't a legal drama, this is people going in and dissecting a nonsense biblical rewrite. It's Bible fanfiction, or Sonic the Hedgehog fan, Sonic, Pokemon, Bible fanfiction. Like, that's modern Christory. If you thought it was something else, you're going to be extremely disappointed. So it's disheartening seeing people say that modern Christory is dull or boring, because, as I've said multiple times, Chris is kind of like the Truman Show. And the Truman Show would be the most boring television program of all time. I think that's why a lot of people like watching Gino's documentary, because even though it covers basically everything, it still makes it digestible. Like, you don't have to sit there and watch every single one of Chris's captain logs. You don't need to read every single one of his tweets to get the story. It's being presented to you in a very narratively interesting way. And those people who are expecting modern Chris breaking news to be as exciting as uh, the retrospective of looking back at chris -tory are going to be disappointed. And I think that that's something that's leading to this phenomenon of people who are wanting to make something happen. You know, they're, they're poking the stick, saying, do something, like in, like in the meme. I don't think there's a singular reason for why people want to interact with Chris, for why they want to be a part of chris -tory. All I can do is continue to not promote them as best as I can. Back in the day, I asked my audience what I should do if somebody uh, responds to one of Chris's tweets in a very um, trollish or attention-seeking manner, and Chris responds to them. That obviously has to be part of the story, but I don't want to give that person attention, so what should I do? And the response was that I should not censor their name, that it is part of the story, and, let, and that unless it's something egregious, that's just reality. To this day, I still don't know exactly what the ethical response is, but I do know that one of the things that can be done is to highlight people who are not taking advantage of the situation for monetary gain. But what I can do is highlight the people who I think are covering Chris ethically. Like I said earlier, as far as I'm aware, Smokey is not interacting with Chris in such a manner as to become part of the story. I've mentioned a couple times, but Yuri the Awkward is a new channel that I love watching who is covering Sonichu in a very entertaining way. It's a new take and a new way of interacting with Chris's art that is not being done as far as I know with the intention of taking advantage of Chris's fame. It's merely looking at the story of Sonichu and interacting with it as a piece of art. Where Helena has become part of chris -tory, I don't think her motivation has ever been to do so. I think her motivation is to interact with Chris. I don't think that the YouTuber Project SNT ever wanted to be a part of chris -tory when she decided to redraw all of the Sonichu characters. Unfortunately, she since has become so because people wrote fanfiction about her interacting with Chris, and Chris started tweeting about her a lot. That does not mean that she did anything wrong. It's ridiculous to think that I would have to shout out Gino, but obviously he is the best example of people who are covering Chris in an ethical way. Short tangent, I love the fact that Gino retweets people on Twitter who are, like, calling him out or calling him or the series gross. I think that's the perfect way to deal with that kind of nonsense, and it's also, like, hilarious. My camera overheated, so now this is audio only. My other recent obsession is Sonichu Psychology. It's a series still in its infancy on a channel that does not have anywhere near as many subscribers as it deserves. That's basically my list of recommendations for ethically sourced Chris Chan content. And I guess my overall feeling with being upset with people who want to be part of Christory is that it shows some sort of lack of ability of somebody's own lack of understanding of themselves. Nobody should want to be part of Christory. They should want to be their own story, and if their own story involves Christian, that's fine. I would obviously be a hypocrite to say anything else, but the desire to be a secondary character or honestly, not even a tertiary character, just someone in the background, again, jumping on camera saying, hi mom, and waving your hand. It's pathetic.
In this video, I discussed a lot of different examples with what I hope is nuance, with what I hope is my own explanation as to why certain things are okay and certain things are not. I think everybody's going to draw their arbitrary line in the sand differently. You might agree with me that what Gino is doing is fine, but what Helena is doing is not. And I genuinely look forward to seeing people expressing that opinion in the comments. Maybe some people are totally okay with YouTubers taking advantage of Chris, but aren't okay with the idea guys doing it because they were hiding in the shadows. Just because I don't agree doesn't mean I don't see the logic in coming to that conclusion. I don't want to sit here and proselytize to you guys, I don't want to say that this is my morals and ethics and you must follow it. I simply want to say that in this moment of history we're experiencing a fresh phenomenon, or at the very least a fresh expression of an old phenomenon. And this is what I think about it, and this is my continuing commitment to not talking to Chris. I long ago said that the only time I could ever see myself interacting with Chris is if I was in physical proximity to him, like at some sort of hypothetical convention where we ended up in the same room. I would not ask him questions, I would not interview him, it would be a simple, I'm Gibby, I don't like you, but I still see you as a person. And frankly, that's an attitude that I see myself having forevermore into the future. Chris can't take back the horrible things that he did, and based on his current personality, I don't see him uh, repenting anytime soon. And so I'm going to end this video by saying, make sure to be nice to each other in the comments, consider supporting the creators you admire, and never lose sight of the things that are important to you. You can follow me on Twitter, at GIBI underscore Devin, and subscribe for more news in the ongoing tragedy of Chris Chan as well as solemn discussions like this, which I reiterate I do want to be discussions, and I hope to hear from you in the comments. Thank you.